early in my walk with the Lord, I got delivered from that uh, Messiah complex where I got to go out and save the world. <laughs> because remember, uh, uh, God said, uh, I have 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to bend. Oh, I love so, it. Yep. You know, so I, all I'm responsible, like I'll take a, a phrase from the sporting world. You can, yeah. control, you can only control what you can control. Hmm. You just do what, what God tells you to do and don't worry about the rest. And I feel a stirring in my heart that I can't come. Hey everybody and welcome to this next episode of the KOG that is the Kingdom of God Entrepreneur Show. I am your host, Stephen Harris. And today on this episode, we have a very special guest by the name of Robert Hitchman. How are you doing today, Robert? I'm blessed. And uh, yourself? Oh, I'm doing great. It's, uh, it's a good time of year. The, the weather has cooled down here in, in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and it, it's nice to go outside and not get eaten alive by the mosquitoes <laughs> and not sweat the second you step outside. So I'm uh, doing pretty well. But uh, thank you for asking. Mm-hmm. And for all of those of you watching, uh, Robert is the author of Blessed is He Who is Not Offended. Talk about a title for a book that is so appropriate for today. We are at the beginning of October 2020, just had the first Trump-Biden uh, debate a few days ago, and <laughs> our country is divided <laughs> like crazy right now. People in the kingdom of God in America are so divided right now. So please uh, tell us about this book and uh, you know, give us a little bit of your, your background as well. Okay, thanks for having me, Steve. Um, I wrote this book a few years ago. Uh, I just started to uh, market it in earnest recently, but um, something the Lord laid on my heart because I was seeing how, how many Christians, how many people in the kingdom of God are getting offended over nothing. Um, so that's why I was led to write this book. Uh, hmm. I'm originally from uh, born and raised in New York, grew okay. up in Queens, but I... Uh, I was born. I jokingly say I was born in Brooklyn, and you can't get more American than that. But um, yeah, I I grew up in a family which I would say is middle middle class. I mean, we were by no stretch of the imagination rich or poor. Okay. Always had clothes on my back, uh, not designer clothes, but always had, but not in rags, I, not even hand me downs. Even though I had an older brother, I had always had uh, food in the table, um, and we were you know I was pretty blessed. My, I had two. I came from a two-parent home, and my brother and sister, we all have the same three parents, uh, excuse me, same two parents, <laughs> and um, so I was blessed in that respect. Now, I wouldn't call our family what you would say a religious family, uh, although my mother made me go to Sunday school every Sunday, but I was like a lot of people. As soon as they stopped making me go, I stopped about the age of 12 or 13, and I was kind of nerdy in high school, and then... Um, I went to uh, college and one of the college, I just, I just went buck wild, okay. but uh, I, I found myself in California uh, trying to play uh, college baseball in 1982. Hmm. And uh, I was there for, I would say uh, three and a half years, yeah, from fall of 82 to spring of 86. And in the middle of that is when I got saved. I actually got saved playing pro baseball in Mexico Very nice. uh, okay. through, through another uh, ball player. Uh, he was actually a um, a member of, and as far as I know, I haven't talked to him in years, decades actually. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Fred Price's church, but he was a member of that church. It was a large church in LA, uh, Los Angeles, California. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's, I don't know if you remember, I'm originally from Los Angeles. And I think oh, that's you're right. in Long yeah. Beach, right? I was living in Long Beach. Okay. Yes. Uh, I was living in Long Beach and... Um, and I actually ended up dating a Christian girl while I was playing ball, and she okay. gave me a Bible. And when I ended up in Mexico, I had plenty of time because the spring training in, in this country and Mexico is totally different. Okay. Here, it's like almost a job, eight to 12 hours you're on the field or in meetings. But there you got two hours of, of uh, <coughs> excuse me, two hours of batting practice. That's about it. So I had plenty of time in my hotel room just to read. And um, okay. wow. I started reading. And um it's the Holy Ghost got all over me. I just started getting convicted. And because yeah. I heard the term born again, I heard the term uh, saved and lost. I didn't know what they meant. And because uh, I've always thought I believed in God, you know, I believed yeah. in Jesus, but I never really 
confessed him as Lord and Savior. Okay. And uh, that's when I, um, basically, that's uh, when I ended up uh, accepting Jesus. Okay. As far as the book is concerned, after I got finished playing ball, I guess I got back to New York, I want to say around 1989, 1990. Right. Um, I've been saved a few years. I started working for the phone company. For it, it, at that time, it was New York Tel. Now it's Verizon. Oh. And, uh, and the first 10 years, I was a splicer, which meant I was either up a pole or in manhole. So I didn't have a lot of direct uh, contact with customers. But then I started my last 15 years or so, I started working, uh, it's called installation and repair. And I was in customers' homes. And I don't know if you ever try to call customer service. Of I, I, I you know, I was a, a salesman for Verizon for okay. a, a couple of years, and during the the strike a couple of years ago, I had to do some customer service for them. <laughs> okay. So I know exactly what you're talking about. But the thing about it, when people try to call, they can't get a human. So when I'm in their house, yeah. I am the face of Verizon at the time. So yeah. all they just unloaded. But my my point of all that is. It's through not only with customers, but coworkers, a union, management. I learned, I had plenty of opportunities to get offended. But <laughs> the, the book is based on this, um, Psalm 119, 165. Okay. Great peace have they who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Of course, thy law mm-hmm. is referring to his word. Okay. And what, that stuck with me because as a Christian, I always consider myself a serious Christian, and which means I don't just you know go to church on Sunday and, that's, and then – Okay, God, I'll see you next Sunday, that type of thing. No, I read the word every day. Uh, and as you know, it's a growing process. And when I came across that scripture, it, it said, well, I shouldn't be offended. And that's how I learned what offend me. I started studying what it means in the Hebrew and the Greek. Okay, wow. And, that, and that's what the uh, Lord laid on my heart to um, read. And another reason why I wrote this, I think a lot of people can relate to this. People, I was like a lot of people over the age of 30 or 35 who say, you know, I've been through so much stuff. I, sh- I ought to write a book. Well, I did. So, I mean, that's how, okay. that was my thought process on that. Oh, wow. I love it. Wow. And that's, oh, goodness. I mean, I'm just thinking about, again, the whole being the face of Verizon at that yeah. time. I remember I was the voice of Verizon. And again, yeah. I, was work- I was working for a third-party acquisition company that Verizon okay. hired to sell the product. But because right. of the strike, Customer service calls were coming to us. Directly. And all we were really doing was seeing if they were calls we could try to upsell them or make a change on their account. <laughs> and then they would have to hear everything they said, all their complaints. And it's like, uh, you know, 90% of the time you can't do anything for them except transfer them to the real customer service, right? right. We were just filtering out for that 10% of customers that we could handle. Okay. Because it was just a matter of putting in a new order, right? Right. And, and I remember just as – a salesman, like, gosh, these complaints, I feel bad for these people, right? Um, so, yeah, and <laughs> look, I've been in sales a number of years. Actually, when, uh, and, and if I may finish that statement, I've been in sales a number of years, and when people in New York have an issue, <laughs> it's at a whole nother level from the oh, yeah. country. I'll just be honest with you. I work, at, I work in the health industry now. You know, this is my day job, working in the health industry. And, right. Medicare. and when people in New York have a problem, <laughs> it goes up to it, like on the, you know, the whole thing, take it up to 11, like Spinal Tap, <laughs> right? They, their frustration goes to an 11. If you, you just see New oh. York in the, the caller ID. But anyway, go ahead. Well, the thing, um, it's funny you mentioned that because – I think one of the blessings of growing up in New York, it gave me a tough, tougher skin than maybe some of the rest of the country. Yeah. So I'm that's why kidding. things don't really offend me like other people do. Yeah. It's just like, but that bothers you, really? You know, so, <laughs> and I think maybe that's part of the reason why God chose me. Another reason I always say is that I was uh, never, I was like never a good student in high school. I was like a C student with English being my worst. And and I think if you went back to um, some of my old high, uh, high school English teachers and told them I, somebody had write a book, they'd be on the floor rolling, uh, laughing hysterically. Because, but see, I see that as a fulfillment of the scripture where God says, God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Yep. So f- for me to write a book is like, oh, that's what you want. Okay, Lord. Hmm, yeah. 
Wow, that's interesting. I mean, even, uh, you know, I was telling you before we, we uh, started recording this, you and I spoke and met, you know, we met on Facebook and spoke on the phone about three weeks ago. Even the conversation I had with you really challenged me because in the last three weeks, I've had a number of things that have crossed my Facebook wall or people sending me direct messages that my initial reaction is like, you know what I mean, just to get up here because these are uh, fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord who are having polar opposite uh, political opinions. Oh, yeah. And to myself and what I would say, this is what the Bible's checking off on the list, right? Oh, exactly. And it's just exactly. such just hatred, right? To where I just want to like get on there and, and have this debate with them. And then talking to you, it really made me check myself. Um, even, you know, before, again, we started recording this, you were telling me about that word offense, right? And what it really means. Right. And uh, please, if you could unpack that, I, I think the audience can get so much from that. Okay, really, the reason why, one of the main things is, and I wrote about this in one of the chapters of the book about, it's, uh, you cannot offend God. Because mm -hmm. if you've been in church any length of time, you probably heard the statement so, somewhat like, um, you want to keep sin out of your life because you don't want to offend God. Mm -hmm. Probably heard something to that effect. Of course. And I understand what they mean. And you do want to keep sin out of your life. Don't get me wrong. But it's, that's not the purpose of it. Because the reason why God wants sin out of your life is because he knows it's deadly. I like a, one bumper sticker I saw years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. Inflation hasn't um, affected the wages of sin. It's still death. You know, <laughs> so, um, so <laughs> yeah. But that's the reason why you, need, you don't want to offend God. Because the... the the word offend, basically, it's, it's about maybe four or five different words in the, in the Hebrew and about five or six in the Greek. Okay. Generally means to, uh, to trip up, to cause to stumble, and in other places it means to entice to sin. And my question is, do you think that you or anybody else out there is so big and bad that you can do those things to God? Hmm. Do you really think you can entice God to sin? Yeah. So obviously, that's not what it means. Now, hmm. if that's not what it means, what is the word we're looking for? Yeah. It's the word grieve. Hmm. Now, grieve, because you will hear scriptures, grieve not his Holy Spirit, grieve not God, Spirit of God, that type of thing. Because sin grieves God, because the word grieve actually means to bring low or to, uh, to make sad or to sorrow. And God can have those emotions because when he sees his children hurt, well, anybody actually, but especially his children um, well, down in sin or, or, or hurting, it hurts him. It, 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 it makes him sad. Yeah. That's why he wants, he wants the best for you. That's why he wants, um, he doesn't want, he wants you to keep sin out of your life. It's not to keep the fun out of your life, but he, cause he wants the best for you. Yeah. I mean, look at Nineveh with Jonah, right? They were exactly. anti Yahweh people or anti you know, exactly. the God of, of Moses people. And God still was concerned about the 120,000 and they're right. being saved from destruction. Exactly. Well, I'm sorry. No, but, but see, that's the, that's the main focus is that when people, yeah. if you really know what, the word offends means uh, you won't let those things offend you because back to the, um, the basic uh, scripture that the book is based on great peace have they who love thy law. So when you have, when you love his law, first of all, you'll be walking in love. You'll be walking in, in you walk by faith, hmm. you're walking in peace. And then you won't let these things bother because you know, it's in God's hand. As long as you're living for him and it's, you're going to have challenges and things that people are going to come, like you said, people, and I'm getting the same thing on Facebook. They're bringing up things that you're like, how could you as a Christian stand, you know, stand with those people, you know, it's yeah. because of the things they represent, you yeah. know? And, and the thing I didn't like is how Christians on both sides, whether it's president Trump, president Obama, Bush or Clinton, yeah. it's how they demonize them. And when the Bible says we're supposed to pray for our leaders and not supposed to speak evil of them. I'm not saying that you have to like what they do, but yeah, no matter whether you like it, yeah. my attitude is this. Every mm -hmm. first Tuesday in November, and I know who I pray and ask God, who do you want me to vote for? But regardless of who wins on Tuesday, that Tuesday, that following Wednesday, I'm praying for them. Mm -hmm. You know, whether I voted for them or not. Because yeah. Second Tim, excuse me, First Timothy 2 says, one of the scriptures, it says, pray for all those in authority. Yeah. Well, notice he didn't say pray for the um the person you voted for, pray for the person in your party, 
pray for the person you like. It didn't even say pray only for the Christian ones or, or the ones who act like Christians. Yeah. And my take, my take on it, if you actually think about it, you probably have to pray more for the one you didn't vote for, when you didn't like. Because think about it. If you're, if you're, um, if the guy you voted for, the, the woman you voted for, is in office and they're doing everything you want, they promise they're, they're passing bills that you want them, or they're vetoing bills you want them to veto. Yeah. How much more do you have to do than maybe maintenance prayers, like, um, Lord, give them wisdom, surround them with godly men and godly counsel, deliver them from evil, you know, protect them in the family. But I mean, basically, that's all you got to pray. But it's the one who's uh, who's praying, who's doing everything against your values. Those are the ones you have to like pretty much get on your face and fast and pray. So, yeah. Lord, open his eyes, please. You yeah. know, I'm being a little facetious here, but you get my point. Yeah, I mean, Prophet Daniel, what did he do, right? Exactly. You see it, the Nebuchadnezzar, uh, um, was it uh, Darius, you know, the, Dan, the God of Daniels, the God of gods, and the Lord of lords, right? right. These were major pagan rulers with right. mul a multiplicity of God, a pantheon of gods that they worshipped. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. But, but Daniel had the right mindset. And I think that's one of those things where modern Christianity, we inherited in this country a Christian value system, right? Exactly. Based, you know, it started with that foundation and it has exactly. evolved, I would say, since the, the, the late 60s, right? And then now right. it's just very secular country. And that's where we're at. Yeah. Right. So, so it's interesting because even, like I said, this morning, I got one of those emails on Facebook from, from a, a friend of mine that was like, why are you sending me this? Like, what, <laughs> what, what is the intention here? Like, and, and I was thinking, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm doing an interview with Robert today and he's talking about not being offended. So, okay, just have a sober perspective because you think about it, especially now with the upcoming election and, um, right. you know, I think one of the tendencies of people like myself and yourself, right, who come from that, let's say, that more charismatic Christian background with more of a prophetic bent, it's easy right. to feel like we have to carry the burden of it, right? Oh. Like our job is to have to go out and persuade everybody to see from our perspective and our convictions. And, you know, his burden is easy or what is it his yoke is easy and his burden is light right yeah. so how do we contain that you know and this isn't a question we talked about in advance but how do we take that whole uh paradigm of jesus you know the burden is light and the yoke is easy how do we take that with the context of not being offended okay well i'm glad you brought that up because i actually got early in my walk with the lord i got delivered from that uh, messiah complex where i gotta go out and save the world <laughs> because remember, uh, uh, God said, uh, I have 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to bed. Oh, I love so, it. Yep. you know, so I, all I'm responding, like I'll take a, a phrase from the sporting world. You can yeah. control, you can only control what you can control. Hmm. You just do what, what God tells you to do and don't worry about the rest. You yeah. know, you share what the script. I have a friend of mine. Um, I think he moved down South now, but he, uh, he used to be in our church and you know, what he taught us a class of witnessing. And he said, witnessing or evangelism basically is sharing the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ in the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost and leaving the results up to God. You, know, yeah. you don't need to get offended because someone says something different, even if they're a believer. Now, it may be surprising, but you share what you have to share and you move on and you just pray for them and don't let it bother you. Now, I know that's easier said than done, but that's why you have to spend time in the Word, spend yeah. time in prayer. So when those situations come up, not if, but when those situations come up, they doesn't throw you for a loop. Because yeah. I also talk about in um, the book, um, in Mark 6, I believe it is, where the situation where Jesus, um, he taught the word, and then he went to lay hands on, it was about, he's trying to lay hands on the sick and to, to heal people, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, all of a sudden they started saying, you know, wait, isn't this the carpenter's son? Who is this person? <laughs> Yeah, you know, who was he to tell us? And I remember one, I think it was Jerry Zavell, he said something to the effect of um, the people were saying stuff, I used to change his diapers. I mean, I used to babysit for this kid. Who was he to tell us what it and but and the Bible says and they were offended at them. And then um the scripture says that uh he laid hand he could only heal only a few. In other words, a lot of people didn't receive the healing. Now I had been taught for years and I believed it, and I know it's to a degree it's true. He says the reason why people didn't receive their healing 
is because the uh, lack of faith when it says he marveled at their unbelief. Yeah. Which uh, is true. Overall, it's true. But my, my question is, um, why would they have a uh, lack of faith? Because he just taught the word. And the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of, of God. Well, I submit to you the fact is they allowed themselves to get offended, which can short circuit your faith. So yeah. that's, and see, it's not just about short circuiting your faith for its healing. If you allow yourself to get handed, uh, excuse me, offended, it can short circuit your faith where it, wherever God wants to use you, like to minister to that friend or to share the gospel with other people. But if you, one person says something to you and the devil's going to pick at you, try to get you, see, you hear what they said, remember what they said? Can you believe they believe that? And all that type of thing. And you dwell on that and you end up getting offended. Well, when it's time for you to go out somewhere else and preach to someone or, or, or minister to someone about any other subject, Excuse me. You're still thinking about what that person said, or you're just not as strong or as sharp as sharp as you need to be. So that's why it's important not to allow yourself to get offended. Yeah. Wow. And I love how you said you you're, you you stay responsible for what God has given you, right? It's exactly. About stewardship. Because um, my message here in KG Entrepreneur is the idea of the kingdom of God is something, it's dominion that was given to us in the time of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve sinned, right? There was original sin. And then as generations went on, man forfeit that a, a dominion over to the enemy, right? To, to the devil and to his, you know, principalities, powers, and dark rulers and all that exactly. stuff, right? And as Jesus came and died on the cross, we were now given back that original dominion. And the exactly. reality is, the kingdom of God is a here and now concept, right? Right. Exactly. We as a Christian culture are so caught up in the hereafter that the world's going to hell in a handbasket. We're like, well, we're going to die and go to heaven. So, right. you know, the Bible said this is all going to happen anyway, right? And we're passive right. and, you know, bury our head in the sands as the saying goes. But right. we're all responsible for stewardship. Exactly. And from stewardship comes multiplication. And the idea right. is entrepreneurs by nature understand that. Right. Whether they break those principles apart and live by that kind of saying or mantra or whatever, right? It's ingrained. You turn on Shark Tank, they get stewardship and multiplication, right? They're, they're gajillionaires, you know? Right, okay. But we, the people of God, ah, you know, it's I pay my tithe, I show up to church, I don't cuss or cheat on my spouse or <laughs> do this or that, so therefore I'm good, and the whole world's falling apart, right? Yeah, that's like the... Uh... The, the guy who got given the one talent and buried it. <laughs> exactly. Yep. So that's not what we're supposed to be about. Yep. It's, it's a delicate balance of uh, not being lazy and just hiding your talent as opposed to not trying to have the Messiah complex and go save everybody and do everybody else's job. Yeah. It's, it's, it's seeking God for what he called you to do, not somebody else, what he called oh. you to do. Yeah. And, um, making sure you get that right. Cause I've, I'm sure you heard the, the, the analogy about, um, well, the, the Bible talks about there are many parts to the body. Yeah. You know, um, I've heard, I forgot who said this, but they said something, you know, this person speaks all over the country. What if their thumb decided, you know, he speaks all the time. I want to do speak, you know, th that wouldn't work out too well. You know, you have to stay within yourself. And the thing also is that getting offended, allowing yourself to get offended, um, will get you off track of that. That's, see, that's the big problem. It's not like a little thing. Well, it's no big deal. They're sinning anyway. So um, I have a right to do that because of what they said to me. Uh, no, you don't, you know, because, and I like what some, and it also affects how you, how you forgive people if you allow yourself to get offended because it makes it harder. And um, when you don't forgive, I don't want to use plagiarism. I think it was John Bevere said this. If you don't forgive, uh, you forget what God forgave you of. And, and that's the problem because people think, you know, well, you, you don't know what they did to me. Well, what did you do to God? And yeah. see, people put, try to put um, sin in different categories. Now, in the natural, yeah, maybe a little quote-unquote white lie is not the same as murder. Yeah. But uh, the fact of the matter is, um, you don't accept Jesus, you, you're going to hell. It doesn't matter what's, what if you did. Yeah. If you never cheated on your wife, if you never cursed, if you never, you know, but you just didn't do that. So that's, that's the, the mentality that we as in the body have to have. You know, we can't just, um, like you said, just hide our talent and just, I go to church, I pray much, and all that. We have to be good stewards of what he called us to do. 
And I feel a stirring in my heart that I can't contain. <laughs> 